When I was up here just a second ago, I didn't uh, introduce myself, and so I know we do have some guests who came in after the service started, and so if I didn't meet you on your way in, my name is Bill. Um, sometimes people ask me what they should call me, and I just tell them my name. It's totally fine to just call me Bill, um, but it's my privilege to serve as the lead pastor here at the table, and so we do um, really love it when new folks come to our services each and every week, and we really would love to connect with you. Um, and so if you do have questions about anything that happens in the service today or questions about the church, we'd love to answer those for you um, after the service. I'll be available. We'll have some other folks available at our information table. Um, the other thing, hopefully everyone on your way in, you got our One Thing card because what is on the One Thing card today is an opportunity to connect with some folks outside of Sunday morning. We uh, really encourage people to get involved in, in groups, and so we've Started some groups earlier in the year, but one of the things that we do on Wednesdays uh, here at the church is what we refer to as growth groups. And there is a new subject that starts every single month, so you don't have to feel bad about, uh, you know, maybe feeling like you're jumping into the middle of something. You can always jump in at the beginning of something. And so this Wednesday, so the, in March 8th, 1st, 8th, and 22nd, because we get spring break in there, uh, we will be doing a study that I think is called learning to follow what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so we're going to be talking about how God works in our hearts, how he shapes us to become more like him, and what it means to be a disciple. And so uh, we want to make it super easy for you to get signed up to be a part of that. It starts this Wednesday at 7 o'clock in our kids' auditorium. But there is a sign-up sheet at the information table. So on your way out, you just stop by there real fast, jot your name and email address down. I think that's all we're asking for. And then I'll get you all the information this week. Um, and the logistics and all that kind of stuff. So I'd love to have you if you're interested in that, so that we've got that. Um, the other thing, I really appreciate uh, Connor leading us in worship this morning. It was a little bit last minute, um, and so really thankful that, that Connor um, was available to help us out. Uh, many of you know that Cody's mom, so Cody is our, our worship pastor, uh, his mom back in the fall was diagnosed with uh, a really aggressive form of brain cancer. And so she underwent some treatments and things like that. Um, but for the last couple of weeks has uh, been under hospice care. And um, so she ended up passing away last night. So that's the reason that Cody's not here this morning. And so I would just ask that you be praying for Cody and his uh, brothers and their families as well. You know, something that they knew was coming at some point, but even in the midst of that and the sort of the preparation that can come when you know it's coming, um, it can still really uh, be hard to, to lose a loved one like that. And so for those of you that are interested in like funeral arrangements and things like that, we'll make sure that we get that out um, if you want to support him and, and, and the family in that way as well. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get into this morning's message. Heavenly Father, you know, as we think about your goodness, um, I, I think about Cody and, and Brooke and... Um, their kids and Cody's brothers and, and their families in the midst of this loss. And God, I, I'm so thankful that you are always with us. You uh, provide peace and comfort in the midst of loss. And Father, I pray that you would um, do that for the, the Culbertson family. Um, God, just, just be at work in, in, in that situation. Um, God, just encourage um, Cody as he seeks to encourage his family as well. Father, we do recognize your goodness today. We recognize the, the grace that you extend to us in spite of our faults. You desire to be in a relationship with us. And you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to come to this earth to lay down his life for us so that we could know you. Father, if there's anyone here who hasn't yet taken that step across that line of faith to say yes to Jesus, maybe uh, through something that they hear today would cause them um, to come to faith and God, I pray that you would be with all of us and continue to, to change us so that we can become more like Jesus. Help us to love you well. So teach us today, encourage us through the work of your spirit within us, challenge us in the places of our lives that we need to be challenged. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I wonder how many of you have a friend who's always got a guy, or maybe you are that friend who's always got a guy. So I want to brag on our staff for just a minute, because I think we have a great staff. We have all kinds of different backgrounds and experiences, uh, came to faith in Christ at different 
ages and things like that, different personalities. And so when you put us together, I think we make a great team. Everybody works hard. They really care about ministry. They care about and for people really well. So I, th- I think we've got a great team. And so you know, with the different personalities, there are some idiosyncrasies that we have. And so we like to have fun with those idiosyncrasies. And so that's why like I did a few minutes ago, I can throw Melissa under the bus and I'm willing to back the bus up over her again and run over her a couple more times. And nobody really cares because we just, we know we have fun together. Not really. She was doing, um, she was caring for people well um, as helping visitors get acclimated. And that's one of our key responsibilities on Sunday. That's why she wasn't up here earlier. So, um, but this morning, I want to tell you a little bit about Ronaldo. So hopefully some of you know Ronaldo, hopefully you know who he is, even if you haven't really met him. I'm not really sure where he is right now. He's probably messing around in the lobby. He's got a a key part of the service later. Um, So I'm going to run the bus over Ronaldo a little bit too. But um, Ronaldo's doing, he's doing a great job. So Ronaldo is our student ministry associate. And so he's learning and growing as he leads the way with our our students, just just doing a, a great job. But Ronnie is what we call him. I'm not sure that he want, would want everyone to call him Ronnie, but I call him Ronnie. Ronnie, for me, is that person who's always got a guy. So Ronnie has a shoe guy. He's got a t-shirt guy, a hat guy. I don't know. He's probably got a, a pants guy. If you need a place to go eat, he's got, he's got a place for you to go. I mean, he's always got a guy. And so for months... Ronnie has been telling me, he's like, Pastor Bill, we got to get you some Jordans or some Dunks. The reason being is that he wants me to get on Pastor Fashion or Pastor with Sneakers, which those are actually like real things. I don't know why they're real things. I don't, this is just the idiocracy of the world that we live in, that those things are real things. And so he's constantly like, hey, let me hook you up with my guy. Now I got to give you this from my perspective. I'm not sure, but I think Ronnie's guy is peddling in some fake Jordans. (laughs) And so I'm at the point in my life now where I don't need the appearance of wearing Jordans. Like if I'm going to get Jordans, I'm going to get some real Jordans, not some fake Jordans. But at the same time, I also recognize this. I'm like two weeks away from turning 45. And so my days as a fashion icon have probably long since passed. So he can tell me about his guy all he wants to, and I'm just not going to pay attention to him because I don't need that guy. But the last couple of years, our family, we've started a new tradition as a family on New Year's Eve where we have gone out to nice restaurants, and and that's the way we've celebrated New Year's Eve. So get dressed up, go out to a nice restaurant. A couple of years ago, uh, somebody gave us a gift certificate uh, to Fogo de Chao. And so that's what we did. And our kids love steak and it's something that we don't eat very often, you know, because it's kind of expensive. But so somebody had graciously given us this gift card. And so we went there, had a great time. It was wonderful. And so this December, we started to talk about as a family, like, where do we want to go? Do we want to go to the same place, a different place? What are our options and things like that? And so I think that I had been talking about that um, in our offices one day. And Ronaldo comes up to me and says, I got a place. You got to go to Fazenda Gaucha. You got to hear him say it. He's, he's way better um, at languages uh, than I am. Um, and so we began talking about this place. And Ronaldo told me that he kind of explained, it's kind of like the mom and pop version of the Brazilian steakhouse. It's like going to Texas Day Brazil without all the the pretense to it, which really kind of fits who we are as a family. And so I went home, I told Mandy, we talked to the kids about it. Hey, Ronaldo told me about this place. What do you guys think? And they're like, yeah, let's do it. So we got reservation at uh, Fazenda Gaucha, went there New Year's Eve. It was great. We had a great time. It was wonderful. Ronaldo, he's always got a guy, and he'll tell you about a place. The reason I say all of that is Because those of us who are followers of Jesus, we got a guy. But statistically speaking, if statistics are true, the reality is those of us who are gathered this morning rarely, if ever, tell anyone about him. 
It's interesting. 80% of people would be interested in attending a church service with a friend if they were invited. Most people are willing to have cordial spiritual conversations. But studies show that most Christians rarely, if ever, tell other people about Jesus. There are different reasons for that. Some of it is they, it's a desire to be friendly. People feel like if they're telling somebody else about what they believe, they're, they're being pushy and push those beliefs on people. But really, I think the biggest reason that, other, that people don't have spiritual conversations, don't share their faith, don't tell people about Jesus, it comes down to fear. Fear of offending someone. Fear of being isolated from friends. Fear of not knowing something or saying the wrong things. There's all kinds of fear related to it, and that's what holds us back. But we got a guy. We got to tell people about our God. Now, as I say that, I want you to know I'm not saying this should be really easy for us. I don't understand why we're afraid. We shouldn't be afraid at all. And maybe we shouldn't be, but I will tell you that every time that I have a conversation about faith with somebody outside of my specific role as a pastor, I have the physical reaction of fear. It happened this week. I was having lunch with a couple of people. We're talking about baptism. Our, somebody who was sitting at a table next to us overheard the conversation and inserted himself into the conversation. And you know, I thought immediately, oh man, this is a great opportunity to talk about faith. But as soon as I began thinking about that, I got nervous because I didn't want to say something that would push this person who was clearly antagonistic toward Christianity at that point. I didn't want to push them away, so I wanted to make sure I said the right thing, didn't say the wrong thing, maybe to encourage him in some way. And so I get it. It is something that is a little bit scary sometimes, but in spite of our fear, we got a guy. We got to tell people about our guy. And so I'm going to challenge us with that this morning because as followers of Jesus, at some point, we have to move from come and see to go and tell. We are finishing up our series we've been going through for the last several weeks called Come and See. It was with that simple phrase that Jesus welcomed his first disciples into a relationship with him. It was an invitation into a relationship that would change their lives forever. And we've been talking about how that same invitation has been given to each of us. Invitation into a relationship that changes everything about us and lasts forever. But at some point in that relationship, we have to recognize, just like the disciples did, it's not just about me and come and see, but eventually we have to move to go and tell. So that's what we're going to look at. As we look at the last part of John chapter 1 this morning, we're going to be looking at John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen as I read it, or... If you have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, you can navigate your way to our live event and follow along there. It's actually a little bit of a longer section, um, but I think I can read it relatively quickly. And I, I just want to pick up all of this because I think that what happens here is, is really significant. So John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God, two of... Two, the two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you will see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. When he first found his own... He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, We found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, and he found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, and, also, and, and so did the prophets. 
Jesus, the Son of God from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. The first part of the section that I read this morning is actually where we started this series. And so it was with, at this point, two unnamed disciples. We find out that one is Andrew, the other one is never named, but scholars believe that most likely it was John, the author of this book of the Bible, because he never names himself in his book. So we believe it's Andrew and John. At this point, they are followers of John the Baptist. But the message that they had been hearing from John the Baptist is that someone greater is coming. And then one day, as they were gathered together with a head nod and a point, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. And Andrew and John got up and began to follow Jesus. We don't specifically know how long they were following Jesus. I like to picture that it was a couple of miles. So it was a little bit of time that they were just literally following Jesus. And I also like to picture the event that Jesus was kind of messing with Andrew and John a little bit as they were walking down the road. Like maybe Jesus was walking in a funny pattern, making odd turns, or maybe even at one point he just literally did a 360 in the road to just see what Andrew and John would do as they bumped into each other trying to figure out what what Jesus was doing. But at some point Jesus turned around and said, what do you want? And there's really a double meaning in that question of Jesus, like, why are you following me? And then the deeper meaning is, what do you want out of life? And they said, well, we just want to know where you're staying. And again, there's a double meaning in that response, too. We could look at it very literally, like, where are you going? Where are you spending the night? But the word that they use is the same word that we read a lot in John's gospel, the word abide and remain. Where are you abiding? Where are you remaining? And that's when Jesus said, come and see. And it was with that simple phrase that these first two were invited to become disciples of Jesus. Come and see. It was an invitation into a relationship, but it was an invitation to come and learn and grow and explore. And as we are followers of Jesus, for us to be who Jesus wants us to be, it is essential that we learn, explore, and ask questions. That is essential for growth as a disciple. And that's what Jesus invites us into. It's a relationship with him where we learn and grow. And oftentimes the way that we do that best is by asking questions. I don't know if you pay attention to what we have in the lobby when you walk in, but in our cutouts on the wood walls, we have uh, graphically depicted on our wood walls what is what we refer to as the table pathway. It's the stages of growth for a follower of Jesus, and the labels that we put on them. And so it's the typical way that somebody grows. The first stage that we have identified is explore. And so this is the first thing that we do when we come and see. We begin to explore, where we learn and grow. And I love people who are in that stage. I love the honesty that they have. It seems like we lose that a little bit as we uh, grow in our faith. And I love the questions. And I, I say every single week, we want you to ask questions. Have the freedom to ask questions. Always ask questions. If there's something that you're not really sure about or if you don't understand or if you have questions about faith, I want you to know you always have the freedom to ask questions. And hopefully what we give What I give is an honest answer. Sometimes, I'll just be real honest, churches give an easy answer. And I don't want to give you the easy answer, but I want to give you the honest answer. Because I think that's what builds genuine faith and a a great foundation for genuine faith. 
But I recognize when I say that every week, when I say, hey, feel free to ask questions. For a lot of people, it might be intimidating to ask a pastor a question. I understand that. And so one of the other things that we talk about a lot is the importance of groups. Part of the reason that we really want people to move outside of Sunday morning and get involved in a group is because in a group, you can ask questions. And you can wrestle through an understanding of Scripture or how to apply Scripture. You can do that together with other people. And that's what that environment is for. Is, is for. Because for us to grow in our faith, we have to learn and explore and ask questions. That's the come and see. We're invited into a relationship with Jesus, but at some point, we have to move beyond come and see and get to go and tell. But for us to go and tell, especially over a long period of time, we have to remember why we came and saw in the first place. Because as we go through the course of life and we experience challenges, it's easy to lose sight of the goodness of God. And we forget why we began to follow in the first place. And so it's really important for us to remember the goodness of God. Remember the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. Remember why we said yes in the first place. Ronaldo, in telling me about that restaurant, he would have never told me about that restaurant if he did not remember how good it was. It's from come and see to go and tell. We've got a guy. We need to tell people about the guy. So, you know, really what this, what in the entire section that I read this morning describes is the way that faith progressed, the way that more and more people became followers of Jesus. And in the first section, it really goes down through verse 42, we see faith translating from Andrew to Simon, the Simon that we know better as Peter. So it was Andrew who accepted the invitation to come and see, and then it's really interesting the way that it says this in verse 41. He first found his own brother and told him, we found the Messiah. Now, in the original Greek, which is the language that the New Testament was written in, that word first is in in an emphatic position, meaning it's kind of the idea that this was the first thing he did. He became a follower of Jesus, and then without thinking about it, without doing anything else, without even breathing, the first thing that he did is he went and found his brother and said, we found the Messiah. The most effective witness for Christ is from friend to a friend or family member to a family member. But likely many of us, when we hear about the importance of sharing our faith with other people, That's not what we think about. I went to college at a place called Cedarville. It was Cedarville College when I went there. It's called Cedarville University now. It's a small Christian school in central Ohio. Every Friday night, a group of students would get in a university van and drive about an hour to downtown Columbus with the goal that they would uh, engage people in conversations and be able to share their faith. And I am sure that at times there were productive conversations. But I know this, there was only a very small group of people who were willing to do that. When I was in seminary, I had a class on evangelism, how to share our faith, why it's important to share our faith, and then how to encourage others to do the same thing. One assignment that we had that semester was to share our faith with a certain number of people. And so to facilitate that, there was a trip that was arranged to go to the bus station in downtown Dallas. So I heard about this, and I thought to myself, you know what? It's an easy way to knock this thing out real fast. I'll go. And so I did. And I will tell you, I tried. I tried the very best that I could. I did not get very far. When I was a kid, so at least... 40 years ago, probably even goes back even further than that, 50 years ago, maybe 60 years ago, there was a big movement um, to train people and encourage people to do door-to-door evangelism. So it was like literally knocking on people's door that you've never heard, you've never met before. They open the door and you say, hey, can I share with you how to go to heaven when you die or whatever the methodology was at the time. 
when, for many of us, when we hear we need to be sharing our faith with people, we think about people we've never met, people that we do not know, never thinking about how that message is received from, by other people. Because I don't know about you, over the last 10 or 15 years, I've had lots of solicitors knock on my door. And I have just made the decision, regardless of what it is, unless it's a, a kid who's selling candy, I might buy that. But anybody else, it doesn't matter what you're selling, I'm not going to buy it. It doesn't matter how great of a deal it is or how it's going to change my life, whatever the solar panels are or the electricity you know, provider or whatever it is, I'm not going to do it. And you know why? I don't trust you. I don't know you. I don't trust you. And you just knocked on my door at 6 o'clock at night in the middle of dinner. I've got a lot of other things to do than listen to your sales pitch. Now hear me, I'm not saying if God prompts your heart to talk to somebody about Jesus that you do not know. I am not saying that. If that's the case, if God calls you to do something like that, do it with gentleness and respect. But for most of us, rather than doing that thing that scares us to death, let's concentrate on the thing that's proven to be far more effective. Friend to friend, family member to family member. Let's keep going in our text because what we read is that faith is spread from Andrew to Peter and then in the next section from Andrew to Philip and Philip to Nathaniel. Verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, he found Philip and told him, follow me. Now we look at that and say, well, Jesus is the one who found Philip, right? But verse 44, Philip was from Bethsaida, which is the same town as Andrew and Peter. And so we could read that and say, man, that's a crazy coincidence. These three guys are from the same hometown. Or we could say, what's probably actually happening, and scholars would say this, is that probably Andrew went to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, I have somebody else that I want you to meet. And so they went, and Jesus found Philip. And with Philip, Jesus said to him, follow me. It's the same message that we read that was given to Matthew, the tax collector. In his tax collector's booth, Jesus walked by and said, follow me. And Matthew got up and left everything and followed Jesus. Now, the, the call to follow me or come and see, in reality, it's not that different. The end result is the same. They both become disciples of Jesus. So there is maybe a slightly different nuance between come and see and follow me. But I want you to know this. When Jesus says, follow me, it is a call to be in relationship and have our lives changed. It is not just about what happens when we die. Because what Jesus was doing at this moment was calling people as his disciples. Which was something that, honestly, lots of rabbis had disciples in the first century. John the Baptist had disciples. That's what Andrew and John were before they became disciples of Jesus. And so what that meant was is that young men, in most cases, would, it's young men who would follow around a teacher. They would live with them. So they would listen to his teaching, but it was more than just listening to his teaching. It was living with him so that his life would rub off on their lives, so that they would be learning and growing and understanding what the teacher was saying, but that their lives would become a lot more like that, the life of their teacher. And so that's what... Jesus invites us into, it's a relationship to have our lives shaped by Jesus so that over the course of our lives, we become more like Jesus. It's a, an invitation to have our lives transformed forever. That's what it's really about, not so much just impacting what happens when we die. So Jesus used that invitation, follow me. Our lives are shaped by Jesus. I mentioned this last week. The apostle Paul wrote in Philippians, for me to live is Christ. And what he meant by that is that he recognized this idea that our lives should be changed. And so for Paul, he wanted when people to look at him to not see Paul and Paul's character, but to see Jesus and Jesus's character. So I got to ask you, I got to ask us, when people look at us, what do they see in us? Do they see Jesus in us? From come and see, to go and tell, from Andrew to Peter, and Andrew to Philip, and then from Philip to Nathaniel. 
Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law. Now, I want you to notice, this is a detail, it's easy to kind of gloss over. When Andrew found Peter, he said, we found the Messiah. When uh, Philip finds Nathanael, he says, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. It's really interesting because it's two different descriptions of the same person, but just different words. It's actually describing the same thing. It's describing the Messiah. First we read, we found the Messiah, and then with Nathaniel, it's we found the one that Moses wrote about. This is important. Knowing the personality and life experiences of a friend allows you to tailor your message to meet their need. Why was it that Philip said to Nathaniel, we found the one that Moses wrote about? We don't know this for sure, but maybe it's because Nathaniel really liked Moses. Maybe if, if we were to ask Nathaniel, hey, who's your favorite hero in the Hebrew scriptures? He would have said Moses. Or maybe he was really interested in Hebrew law, Jewish law, and he studied it all the time. And so uh, Philip says, hey, this guy you're really interested in, you read this stuff all the time, you study it all the time, we've found this guy. But did you notice then what Nathaniel said? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And you got to understand, so Nazareth is a small town. Lower income area. It's kind of like saying Jesus is from the other side of the tracks or lives on the other side of the lake. No offense to our folks from that side of the lake. Maybe it's better for us to say it like this. It's like saying Jesus was from Arkansas. (laughs) Again, no offense if you're from Arkansas. But you guys get it, right? That's in essence what he's saying. And Philip says, come and see. I want to talk about some evangelistic methodologies for just a second. And and so for some of you, if you're new to church, maybe you've never been exposed to an evangelistic methodology, and that's okay. But for those of you that grew up in church, maybe at some point in your life, you have signed up for a class to learn how to share your faith. And in that, they gave you specific methodology. Here are the things to say, the steps to follow, and things like that. And I want you to know, again, I am not saying that evangelistic methodologies are bad. They are sometimes very, very helpful. But what they are is kind of a canned approach. Here's what you do. Say this, then say that, then say this. What those evangelistic methodologies, I think, assume is that the thing that's keeping somebody from coming to faith in Jesus is ignorance, that they just don't know. And so if we tell them, then they will naturally, of course, say yes. I don't believe today that the only reason, maybe not even the biggest reason, that keeps people from coming to faith in Christ today is ignorance. Because there is so much skepticism about Christians and Christianity. Not really sure that they can trust the things that we say. And so we recognize today we can't just tell people about Jesus. We have to show them Jesus. That's why it is far more effective to share our faith from friend to friend and family member to a family member because hopefully we are already in relationship with them. They know us. They can trust us. And so as we love people well, that's what allows us to have spiritual conversations with people. Nathaniel says, hey, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip says, well, just come and see. And so I want you to know, if you ever get resistance from a spiritual conversation, you're like, well, I'm never doing that again. Listen, you're not alone. Because from the very beginning, there was some resistance. But Philip said to his friend, Nathaniel, just come and see. Come and experience Jesus, because I know he's going to change your life. And that's exactly what happened. He went and he met Jesus. And Jesus said, ah, I see you're a good Israelite. There's no fault in you. I saw you under the fig tree. And immediately he says, you are the son of God. And I love what happens at the end of the conversation where Jesus says this. If you thought that was cool, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's from come and see to go and tell. The challenge for us today is we got a guy. We got to tell people about our guy. And so here's what I want 
us to do this week. Very specific application. I want us every day this week to pray a prayer something like this. God, give me the opportunity this week to share Jesus with somebody that I know and give me the courage to step into that conversation. Let's pray that prayer every day this week. God, give me the opportunity and give me the courage and then let's see what God does. And I would love for you, as you have those experiences, to share those with me. Maybe you don't get very far and that's okay. But we got a guy. And whatever your friend or family member is going through, we got a guy that meets that need. And so all we have to do is tell them. And as they come and see, then maybe their lives will be changed forever. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would give us opportunities to tell someone about Jesus this week and give us the courage to step into those conversations in spite of our fears and in spite of whatever it is that might normally hold us back. May we be reminded we've got a guy and we need to tell people about him, the one who rescued and redeemed and restored us. Give us opportunities this week. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So as we finish the service this morning, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and it's okay if we go a little bit over Ronaldo. So I'm going to actually have Ronaldo come up, because we have a student that I want to introduce you to. His name is JC, and JC has been coming to our church for a couple of months now, several months, and man, I love JC's story, because JC is not afraid to tell people about Jesus. And so I'm going to have Ronaldo um, help JC share some of his story. So you guys take it. You said yes to Jesus. Um, basically, I don't know if you, you know, I, I see some students here at like Boswell, but if you ain't know me, I was like the kid that was like fighting people at like seven in the morning at school. Like I, I would come to school and I would just get in trouble. Like I promised every teacher my entire life probably hated me because I would just cause trouble, you know. And I never really was too like interested in religion, nothing like that. And I was just getting in trouble, like, every day. Like, people say they fight every day, but, like, I I was, like, every day, you know? Even if it wasn't, like, conflict, it was just for, like, fun or something, which is crazy to even say. But, (laughs) um, yeah, um, one time my mom called me, so I answered the phone, and she's like, go to your grandma's house. I'm like, man, I don't want to go to my grandma's house. You know, know, but I go there, and... um, I walk in the house, you know, it's a trailer park, actually. So I walk in the trailer. It's my grandma. She's like, oh, you got so tall, stuff like that, making me feel all happy by myself, stuff like that. And um, <laughs> then um, she, had, she was uh, she's really Christian. And up until this point, I've never been interested in none of that. Never. I was kind of, I kind of didn't like Christians. I felt like, oh, they were hypocritical and all this stuff. And then she had a conversation with me, and I'm like, yeah, there could be a guy. There could be some guy upstairs just chilling. But (laughs) um, then she had that conversation with me, and she just started praying over me. And I had my eyes closed, and I just felt like the presence of God. And I was like, I wanted to cry, but I didn't want to look, you know, look look like I'm crying in front of my grandma, you know. So (laughs) I just felt like, you know, him, him coming down. I'm like, this is real. Like, this is actually, like, I see why they do the stuff they do. This is real. You know, so after that, yeah, I just really, I'll be lying if I said I just clean slate, just started doing everything for God. No, I went right back to fighting people at 7 in the morning, you know. (laughs) But, yeah, I guess just eventually just seeking to help me a lot, yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. I hope (laughs) say five people at 7 a.m. Um, man, so after after you said yes to Jesus and, you know, like, you started realizing, like, what it, 
look like to be a Christian? Like, tell us what your life looked like and how do you go about telling people about your faith? Um, I don't really got a strategy, you know. I kind of just, what's up, man? How we doing? You know? Um, I guess, yeah, I just kind of go up to them. And a lot of it is because people have seen, I guess, the change. Because I've always been, I'm not going to say, like, popular, but I've been, like, well-known at school. And I, I, I guess people see the change from this to this. It's, like, black and white. It's completely different, you know? And just really just going up to people and being loving. Because uh, I invite, like, probably like 100 people a day to church on Wednesday, right? And people say no, and it's like, I, I'm not going to judge you for it, you know? I, like, a lot of, I feel like it's more like a being loving is the most important thing. Like, it, how can I talk about a God who does everything out of love if I can't love you, you know? So I'm sitting there, I'm saying, hey, what's up, stuff like that. And I guess it's more like the charisma thing, you know? Like, you go up to someone and have conversations you don't want to talk about because half the stuff people talk about, I don't care about golf. I don't, I don't care about that stuff, you know. And a lot of, so I try to kind of steer the conversation to Jesus, you know, instead of just talking about it when it's up, you know. And you can literally turn almost anything into, like, a Jesus conversation because he made everything, first of all. And second of all, he's present in everything, you know. So you can kind of turn everything to Jesus and you don't got to know, like, knowledge or verses off the top of your head. Obviously, that's good and that's important. And that helps a lot. But it's more just sh living it out, you know? Like, every day after school, my mom doesn't even buy groceries no more for me because I'm out hooping trying to bring people to the church every day, you know, like, uh, and stuff like that. And I feel like it's more like a respect thing. Like, if I, because I haven't been Christian this long, like, I've been, like, last January in that trailer park, you know? So I, I kind of am new to it, and I don't know as much as, you know, certain people know, but I feel I know enough about my God, and I know my God is good. And everybody feels inclined to know about Jesus, right? Every, every Christian you can ask in this room had a hole, and they felt empty before Jesus, right? And then they came to Jesus, and life was completely different. They have that hole inside of them. You know, it's a hole the size of a cross, and all we got to do is tell them about the man that died on the cross, and we can help them get where they need to be, you know? And, um, yeah, like, so <laughs> I guess is be transparent with people, you know? It's because a lot of people, they think, oh, you, oh, I can't do this if I'm Christian. Oh, I can't cuss. I can't, I can't do this, 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 and this. But the thing is, it, he said, come and see. Do you think Simon and Peter, the guy that was slicing ears off, was perfect when he found Jesus? No, he was not, <laughs> you know. You come to Jesus, and then you change. You come and see, you know. That's good, That's good man. Appreciate it. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Uh, thanks for sharing. Um, oh, man, that's funny. That's funny. All right, um, man, to, to finish off, thank you, JC. I really appreciate you. Uh, Oh, man, thank you guys so much for coming here. If you were a guest and you fill out a card, uh, you can leave it in one of the boxes back there or uh, Bill or Melissa are going to be in uh, the table in the back. And then also, if you haven't joined or haven't signed up for the growth group, go ahead and sign up for that. It's going to be March. And then do not forget that God loves you. Your table family loves you. And go share that love with others. Have a good week.